Okie dokie. We are recording. Thank you, Joaquin, for joining us. Joaquin is from Blackspoke, and he is going to talk to us tonight about GCC, GCC High, DoD, and all the other goodies that we need to know in the cloud. Take it away. Hey, I appreciate it, Scott. Thanks for having me again for my second time. It's been a couple months uh, since I've been on this show. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk about, and I'm going to share my screen now, we're going to talk about uh, Office 365 and Azure um, in, in in unclassified commercial environment. There's, you know, there's quite a few cloud environments that they offer. Um, uh, <clears throat> most of the, mo most of my experience with Office 365 has been in commercial and within DoD. And lately we've been, I've been doing a lot of GCC high um, implementations. Um, uh, so we're all familiar with, with commercial. That's, you know, what the typical company uses. And Microsoft has a GCC government community cloud. They have a G, something called GCC high, and then they have a DOD. Um, for some of us that work in in the army slash intel slash dod sectors um that that have office 365 the, those those customers are using likely using the dod environment and i i have some scripts that i'm going to share um uh towards the end of the the presentation that'll you can kind of you could type in a domain name if you know the domain name Type any domain name and it'll tell you if it's registered in commercial, GCC, GCC high, or DoD, which is kind of cool. Um, and these are just the unclassified environments. There's also IL-6, which is, uh, if you look here at the IL levels, uh, there's IL-2, IL-4, IL-5, and then IL-6 and 7. 6 is secret, and IL-7 is uh, top secret. So, <clears throat> um, you can see down here um, the impact levels are those are driven by 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 DISA, so you can look up what an, an impact level is. Um, but you know, mo most environments that are in the DoD they call them IL five environment. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll get into what these environments are meant for, um, and this table kind of explains what each environment is is really for. But typically, what you have is and I work a lot in the defense industry base. There are you know, companies that are supporting the Department of Defense or Intel agencies. Um, Microsoft created GCC High or IL-4 specifically for the defense industry base to meet some FedRAMP capabilities and FedRAMP High is one of them. And then a bunch of other ones like DFARS and, and uh, being able to do ITAR requirements and meet uh, you know, NIST 853-171, um, as well as CMMC. I'm sure you guys have all sort of heard of CMMC, Cyber Security Maturity Model. You know, they've gone from levels one through five. Now they're just levels one, two, and three. You know, some some defense industry-based customers are required to meet that accreditation. And I know that that's still not completed yet, but most of those companies will either have to be in some level of GCC, probably GCC high. Um, but it just depends on their contracts, what they dictate. But basically, it's to share CUI control, but unclassified information between government and defense industry based contracts like General Dynamics, Boeing, Lockheed, all the, you know, big players. And then as well as all the small companies that do work for, uh, you know, contract work for the DOD. So, um, you know, there's a good chance that if you're supporting uh, Army or Navy and you're using Office 365, you're inside the the DOD area. If you're doing a lot of work within the defense industry base, you know, Scott, you know, the company you work for probably has a GCC high implementation. I know General Dynamics does. Um, we Black Spoke don't, don't have one yet. We have commercial. We're thinking of getting into the GCC high space just because we may have some contracts that require us to handle CUI. Um, sorry. One second. Enrique is calling. Um, sorry about that. Uh, um, so <clears throat> these are the four main environments. Now there's other environments in, in, in unclass 
China, and then there's um, Germany as well. My son's calling me, and he's like right across from me. Um, but <clears throat> the ones that most most defense industry base uses is GCC High or, or you know GCC. Now GCC is 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 actually for um, you know local law enforcement uses GCC. Some state and local government use it. As well, so if you support any kind of state and local government uh, industry, you'll probably you're probably in GCC. Um, and again, this table's you know kind of explains what each what each level gets. Now, as you go from left to right, commercial to to DoD, you, you don't you don't have a lot of parity between the environments. Uh, commercial and GCC are fairly close to each other. They they are they use the same endpoints. Uh, you know, seeing URLs to, to access the systems. GCC High uses its own set of endpoints, uh, and, and DoD has its own set as well. And and not all services are available across each of them. Um, <clears throat> there's a really good website, and I'll I'll show it in a little bit. Um, that uh, kind of tells you what services are up and coming for IL IL four or IL five. Um, and what's available now in IL six and IL seven, secret and top secret. If you guys work in those systems, currently Azure is the only thing that's available. Office three sixty five <coughs> is coming into play. Um, uh, for some of the agencies that I support, we're we're already, you know, starting to onboard onto Azure and moving our identity into Azure Active Directory, and um, eventually we'll be consuming, you know. Uh, Office 365 in those environments when they when they come available become available. So this is going to be a big a big migration, a big push to for government to start moving into those into those environments. Um, <clears throat> now, how do you? So I get a, I get a question a lot on how do you get access to government community cloud GCC or GCC High. Um, for the most part. Uh, GCC is fairly easy to get into. There's a website that you click on. You know, here's a link, and you um, you basically ask for a tenant, right, to Microsoft. And um, if you're looking into GCC, they'll pretty much give you the rights to to create a tenant, right, and get into GCC. If you if you ask for GCC High, which they consider level two, um, they'll ask you for some proof that you need to work in that environment. And usually it's it's a contract or something that says, you know, you, you need to handle CUI and they'll get they'll get you access to GCC high. Now the provisioning for GCC is fairly easy. They you can provision a tenant yourself. Um, they'll give you a link and you sign up and you pretty much go on your way and get a GCC environment. For GCC high it takes a while and you also have to go through and that link provides it too. Uh, you also have to go through a partner that sells GCC high licensing. Not not everyone can just buy GCC high licensing. You have to go through a a partner that's that's listed on their on their site. Um, they have probably a hundred partners right now that are listed. <clears throat> but basically, you go you you get approval from Microsoft after they make sure that you have the you know the need for GCC high, and then you work with a partner and the partner will issue you a license. And basically, you get access to a GCC high tenant. Um, what gets a little even more trickier is, you know, if you, you know, if you're, if you're a corporation that needs ADFS or you want to do hybrid identity, you can't just stand up, uh, you know, Azure Active Directory Connect, and start syncing your identities up there and install ADFS and have on-prem identity syncing or anything like that, um, because GCC High requires you to submit network firewall port requests, so. You have to really work with Microsoft. After you get, you get your tenant, you have to work with Microsoft to open up some of the firewall rules on their end in order to let your endpoints access their endpoints. So um, you you definitely can't stand this up overnight and start using it. It takes it takes about a month or so for the tenant to get created. Um, so a couple of weeks for you to get approval, maybe a little sooner, and then about a month or so for the tenant to get created. So if you have any customers that are looking to get into GCC High, you got to you got to plus up that lead time about two to three months before you can officially start doing something in there. And if you have something a little more complex where you want to do on-prem identity or a hybrid model, you know, plan for four to six months before you get everything completed. So 
um, I've run into some some work where they're they're expecting it to be a, a less than a month before you get access to it, and it takes a lot longer. <clears throat> I'll pause for a little bit in case anyone has any questions. Not yet. Um, All right. ex except that the NIST requirement for federal contractors, if they have a Microsoft 365 environment, they don't need to go to GCC high or even to GCC. They can stay in commercial as long as they also have the EMS3 license in addition to G3 licenses for all their people. Is, am I right? So, so the licensing piece is not so much tied anymore to the NIST requirement. Um, some of the NIST requirement, some of the NIST 800-171 requirement says that you, if, if you handle CUI, control but unclassified information, then you have to have data sovereignty. If you have data sovereignty, that means you have to be on a system that is CONUS only, right? Um, and commercial doesn't fit, right? So GCC has CONUS uh, as well as as, as uh, endpoints that are OCONUS. So um, you likely have to go to GCC high if you have data sovereignty needs. But the, you know for sure the services don't don't live in Europe or something like that. Um, so you'll have to be inside GCC high. If you don't have that requirement, and some contracts don't, they don't have data sovereignty requirements. Then you can be in GCC or even commercial to meet any of the 800-171. All, all the 800-171 controls are met by any environment. Where it gets a little tricky is, is if your contract says you're going to handle CUI and you must have, you know, you must meet, uh, you know, some ITAR requirement where you can't have, mm -hmm. you know, ex uh, exporting of any information, which means you have to be data sovereign. So that's where it gets a little tricky. And then there's also some some cybersecurity response time response requirements. So GCC High gives you 72 hours, like that's their their SLA, 72 hours to, to, for a cyber response from Microsoft. GCC doesn't doesn't have a, a SLA of 70 72 hours. So you know if you have a contract that says you know if we if you have a cyber incident, you have to be able to collect the logs within 72 hours from the your you know your cloud provider. GCC High promises that GCC and commercial do not. So it. it gets a little tricky. You know, you got to really look into the legal terms. Some companies, you know, like they'll go through the effort of going to GCC just because it's easier, it's faster. And then they'll get a new contract that says, oh, you must have data sovereignty or you must meet ITAR. And they're like, oh, my God, now I got to go. G you know, so some people just go straight to GCC high just to avoid the potential of having to move around too many times. Yeah, the company I'm with now, fairly large. They've got a commercial implementation, a GCC implementation, and a GCC high implementation. Yeah. Just because of the number of contracts and whatever. So you have to figure out, you know, based on your contract, where they're going to line you up. Yeah. It's kind of weird. And that's, and that's an, imagine uh, that's a nightmare, right? Because, yeah. Imagine being an administrator that four different cloud environments. You know, there's no way to sync settings between the cloud environments, right? So you have to either buy nope. third-party product or you got to have good change management. I mean, there's there's a lot of headaches. It's um, taking a long time to roll everything out. Yeah. A very um, long time. So that's, yeah, that's, you know, that's a big decision right there to, to, to decide whether you're going to have multiple or just a single one. Um, there, there. I was talking about the roadmaps earlier. There's a roadmap and comparisons. You can look at the service comparisons in a roadmap. The roadmap site is actually pretty cool. I'm going to launch that, and uh, you can actually, um, if you go to cloud instance, you know, if you want to see what's up and coming, you got to love DevOps, right? This is all because of DevOps. You got to, you can see what's actually, you know, coming up. You know, 184 in development, 64 rolling out, 262 launch. So this is a nice, you know site to to tell you what's up and coming for each of these environments um so <clears throat> i recommend this site a lot to my customers to that ask me you know what are the differences or what's coming up i i don't know you gotta look at the site because this is and then the 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 comparison um 
link is pretty much, you know, it's a bunch of text, but you know, you can see what's available and what's not um, within each of these environments based on licensing and things like that. So they do a pretty good job of documenting it. The problem is it's just a lot to ingest, right? There's there's just a lot. Um, yeah, it's, have, it's a fairly large beast. And because of it, I'll tell you, I couldn't find documentation about why things are, how they are, but it's the smallest little details. You're like, why didn't they just go ahead and add this? Yeah. You know, the the Microsoft Forms web part for SharePoint doesn't exist in GCC. It's yeah. just like little things like that. And it's so annoying because you're like, I know I did this on my own system just the other yeah. day. Right. Why can't I do it right now? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uh, oddity too. Like if you look if you if you use the uh content role, not the content roll up web part, but what's the other one? The uh highlighted content web part. Highlight, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's some oddities with how you can filter up. Like there's some things that you can't filter up in GCC high and you can do it in commercial, right? And you're like, oh, I needed that, you know? Yeah. Um, but they don't really explain that to you. You kind of just find it on your own. They don't have a <laughs> uh, a good, you know, it's probably out there on TechNet somewhere, but it's so much information and changes every day. Every yes. day something changes every day. and they can't keep up with the documents. Yeah. That's, that's what makes it hard for me is the, the rate of change. I'm constantly reading, constantly trying to listen to everybody else's podcasts and their videos as they come out. And I always feel like I'm still way behind. Yeah. Yeah. It's job security for us, I'm sure. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the, a lot of what's driving going to GCC high is CMMC. Um, for the most part, people are going to GCC high. Um, you know, it's a big move. They're moving everything there. So if you're not familiar with CMMC, you know, it, read up about it. It's it's eventually, if it hasn't already, it's going to impact some of you or all of you. Um, it's basically all the NIST 800-171 controls, now 172, plus, um, you know, plus a couple extra controls. Um, and what's cool about the CMMC stuff, or at least what Microsoft does, is if you go to the Compliance Center, you guys aren't familiar with that, go to the Compliance Center inside your tenant, you can you can use a 90-day free trial of the CMMC template, and you can actually run the template against your, your environment, and you can see what Microsoft recommends to meet those controls. It's There's like 1,500 controls about 700 or 800 of them you in, inherit from Microsoft, like so they handle certain ones and you inherit those, they flow down to you. And there's about 800 controls or so that you have to go implement. Um, and they're not all easy to understand. A lot of them are very legal, you know, le legal terms. So you have to be able to, um, uh, you know, you have to be able to read those terms and, and decide how do you meet that from a technical standpoint or how do you meet that from a, policy standpoint um so there's you know there's a lot uh of stuff there so again most of most of the most of the drive to gcc high is based on this new cmmc requirement um and if you're not familiar with cmmc it's it's basically again it's this 800-171 before you used to do self-attestation and you would just say yeah i'm, I'm i have good cyber security uh, skills in my workforce and we're doing training and we, we encrypt things and we handle things correctly. All you had to do is tell the government, yes, I, I meet all these controls. You didn't actually have to prove it. Now with CMMC, you have to prove it. And the way you prove it is you implement these things and you have an outside body come in and, and audit you. Um, and they go through the audit and they check things and then they, you know, they accredit you. But they haven't finished the whole now. So there was CMMC 1.0 and then now there's CMMC 2.0. They've knocked it down to three levels instead of five, uh, but they haven't finalized how they're going to accredit, how they're going to, you know, if you can imagine a small company with 20 users having to pay sixty, eighty thousand dollars for an accreditor to come in and, and do an accreditation. I mean, it's, it's just some companies are not going to be able to withstand that. So um, there's talks about it going back to you know, just being self-attestation if you're a certain size or whatever, but it's still a little unknown on how this is going to flush out. But 
ultimately yeah. it's, I knew, it's the same as the I knew two companies that were doing a lot of work doing the um certifications for other DOD contractors um planet and seven seven yeah and so, they were something. making quite a bit of money just supporting all of the other contractors in this space so, yeah summit seven is a big uh cmmc vendor right they'll they'll yeah. come in there into your environment and accredit your or at least prepare you to become accredited um mm -hmm. <clears throat> same thing with um planet and planet well, planet's one of the ones that you can actually buy gcti licenses from so um you know so they're one of the accreditation or they're one of the bodies that can you can buy a license from um I, I mentioned a little bit ago about the o365 security and compliance center basically the compliance center has these assessment templates and you can pick cmmc and you can see all these cmmc i don't know if they've updated this recently to be cmmc level cmmc 2.0 these are still the 1.0 templates but most of the defense industry base was shooting for level three that's the the rumor was level three was going to be good enough for you to get a contract with you know direct contract with the government level four and five are more for like they used to be more for like the the uh, cloud service providers themselves like if you owned a cloud and you owned a data center or you had data center space and you were housing government data you'd have to go to level four or level five um but now they've cut this down to just one two and three level one two and three and now what they're saying is the defense industry base should be trying to achieve level two certification, not level three, because level three is for like the big vendors and stuff. Um, so, you know, that's that, that's kind of driving people to move to, to GCCI. <clears throat> you can see these are the, the control domains, the security domains that they uh, look at within CMMC, access control, asset management, audit and accountability um you know so there's a lot to to do in you know in with regards to cmmc if you're going to gccni for that um some other cool things that this is a, so you know these slides are more cmmc focused but if you're going to gcc high or gcc and you're trying to meet some security requirement um they have these things in Azure called blueprints, and you you can basically buy the level three CMMC level three or level two blueprint from Azure and assign it to a policy in your environment, and you can basically uh, most of it's very binary, so it'll check, and you can also check and implement um, against your servers or any kind of services you have inside Azure. So if you you're you're huge Azure, if you have a huge Azure footprint and you're trying to get and you're, you know, you're in GCC or GCTI and you're trying to become CMMC certified or accredited, you can use these blueprints to kind of help you force the settings to pass, you know, to pass the test. <clears throat> this is more Azure Blueprint stuff. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, um, these are DISA sticks, sorry, this slides, oh, so this is the tenant checker. So this is kind of the cool thing I was going to show everyone is like you know if you want if you're working for a, a government customer or a, a defense industry based company or someone that uh you know some company that you're supporting and you're not sure they're not sure if they're in gcc or gcc high or or commercial you can actually run uh this entire script you know save it oops go back uh you can save this to you know ps1 and run it and basically what it looks like is this and um, you can type in, let's see, SJ go. <clears throat> that's not a tenant. So let's do nga.mil, right? So they are in US Gov region and they're in DOD. So you know they're aisle five, right? If you do blacksbook.com, we're in commercial, right? Um, and you can see too the difference. Like there's MicrosoftOnline.us and there's MicrosoftOnline.com. Anyways, the NA is uh, for commercial. And then if you run against another tenant, uh, trying to think of someone that's in GCC High that I knew of. 
Oh, uh, GDIT. So GDIT runs their US Gov, very similar to NGA's region, but they're in the DOD con scope um, subregion. So that's a contractor, right? They can consider that a contractor region or contractor scope. Um, so, you know, if you're ever working for a company that, you know, you want to, uh, for whatever reason, they don't know what what tenancy they have or whatever, um, you can run this this script and it'll it'll basically tell you what environment they're in. It's kind of cool. Um, I've used this quite a few times for, again, companies that just didn't know where their tenancy was at, or I, I they wouldn't tell me and I just wanted to know. <laughs> so. Uh, that that is all I really have. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Did you hear about a separate GCC secret? What was that again, Scott? Did you hear about a separate GCC secret? GCC secret. I could have sworn I saw something like two weeks ago saying that they're going to pump out yet another data center just for secret. Well, so I know uh, IL-6 is Azure is out now um, and Azure's out in IL-7. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I'm under NDA or not to say where the data centers are at. I, I don't I don't think I can, I'm not sure. But I know they have data centers already for IL-6 and IL-7. Um, and then that's just Azure. And then Office 365 is trailing a little bit behind, so. Obviously, O365 sits in, in their own Azure, but um, what what they're saying is, at least for for JWIX or IL-7, is that hopefully by the end of this year or early next year, they'll they'll start having services in for Office 365 to be consumed in in, in JWIX. Oh, that's um, nice. Yeah, and then Secrets close behind. There's a bigger push for for uh, JWIX. JWIX right now than there is Secret. Um, for good reason. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, so that's going to be, you know, there soon. I, I'm already feeling the pressure to be ready. To onboard into those environments when they're when they're here, so. Okay. Well, um, for the recording, at least, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about Black Spoke? And uh, who you guys are looking for? And if someone is doing SharePoint in this space, that is in classified space. What should they be learning to be ready? Yeah, thanks. So, so Black Spoke was started in 2011 uh, by Rich Astrike. Uh, Rich and I became partners about a year later. I was working for Microsoft. He was working for Microsoft. He left. Uh, I started Black Spoke, and um, I was the first employee. So I'm the VP of Engineering and, and Service Delivery for Black Spoke. And our, our heaviest customers are in the Intel community. So we have DIA and, and NRO and NGA are some of our largest uh, customers. Um, but basically what we provide, we started off as like a very Microsoft centric, VMware centric service provider, um, anything data center or VDI based. And then we were heavy into like SharePoint infrastructure and also SharePoint development front-end development and mo mostly back-end development back in the day. Now we do a lot of front-end development. Um, what I, you know, what we're seeing a lot of now is a, a heavy push from government to go into Office 365, obviously, um, especially now that IL-6 and IL-7 are coming on board for Azure. Eventually Office 365 is going to be a thing there. Um, is really, from a SharePoint perspective, we're not, we're not creating solutions anymore on the servers, right? We're not deploying solutions there where everything's front end javascript uh based and what what we look for now from a sharepoint developer is you know how deep are they on the front end skills it's good to have dot net back end skills and be able to develop and understand code but really you know when we start moving into office 365 you're talking about sharepoint frameworks extensions and front end capabilities that you know especially with modern pages, very difficult to develop like it used to be um, unless you use the frameworks uh, SPFX. So we're looking for people that are very familiar with that, who have done that, who've dabbled in that. 
because uh, it's inevitable, right? When we eventually go from our on-prem versions of SharePoint on the high side over to Office 365, the only way you're going to be able to develop anything is, is using that type of platform. So that's a big thing for us. Um, and obviously with Teams and OneDrive and and uh, the link, the, the you know, what creates the glue between Teams and OneDrive and SharePoint and all that stuff, anyone that's familiar with with that full understanding of how to leverage those three technologies together to uh, to provide awesome support is is something we're always looking for too. Um, so that that that's a big game changer for us um, in the next year or so. Uh, you know, it's obviously written on the wall that that Office three sixty five is going to be inside the government. So that's what we're looking for, and. You know, we do have a careers page. A little plug for for us. We most of our work is most of our work is uh, in the Intel community, but you know, we we may be so. We're, you know, there's a contract that we're going after uh, as a prime at NGA that may require some unclass, you know, some unclass flexibility or provide some unclass flexibility there. Uh, but essentially, um, if you go here and go to open positions, you know, we have. A ton of positions available um, today. I, as you can see, most of them require TSSCI and some, if not all, of them require Poly for uh, for our Chantilly customer NRO. Um, but yeah, uh, anyone has any questions, feel free to get a hold of me. Um, be more than happy to uh, to answer questions and and and, and talk more. You hear that, Mike? That means you need to learn all the Microsoft 365 stuff. You and I were talking about this the other day. <laughs> so. No, don't make him panic, please. <laughs> oh, I've already, I've already done the panic. I mean, I, I went out and got my dev tenancy already, so or my dev tenant. Yeah. So the important thing is that if we can get it, or if you know the people who are in this market can get ahead of that curve all these other people who have been hired in the last 15 years because they could spell SharePoint and were getting paid outrageous amounts won't be able to keep on going. And you'll have a leg up on all of them. You know, and I, I, I think that'll be good. Um, I just hope that the government labor rates start to catch back up because of the inflation and everything that we've seen in the last two years so that the uh, market rates um, you know, it, it makes it definitely beneficial to go government instead of going commercial, because if you're going to put up with all the bureaucracy to go government, you know, or into the contract space that, you know, they pay you accordingly. Um, I don't know if with current market, if I would say that government is actually paying better now, the government contracting anyway, in the Intel space, if it's paying better now. Um, it depends. I'm certain that, yeah, yeah. I, I'm certain that it'll be better um, in a year or two when they start cutting new contracts and new labor rates come out and all that. But, yeah, some are some are really aggressive and some are some are some are pretty good. It just really depends. Yeah. From the customers you've dealt with, at least in the secret and the top secret space, what are most talking about when they're talking about going to M365. You know, we're in the process of scanning up uh, SharePoint 2019 on-prem uh, on the on the high side. And I, I'm just wondering where where the if the interest is, you know, you know, moving everything to M365, staying on 19 on-prem or kind of like a hybrid model. So at the two customers I'm at that have 20 xx right I'm, I'm doing a migration now from 2013 and 2019 the one customer and the other one's still on 2013. the biggest thing that they want to do is they're so all of the all of the customers i have have done heavy development inside sharepoint and it seems like every time we go through a migration they have issues they have to refactor a bunch of code and all kinds of stuff so one of the things they want to get away from is heavy development inside SharePoint. I'm not talking about workflows because that's that's a you know that's part of SharePoint is workflows. Um, 
but heavy back end development. Like you could still deploy sol custom solutions in 2013 and 2016. They want to get away from that. So they they believe honestly that going to the clouds can prevent them from doing that. And it's sort of true, right? Because you, you don't you can't deploy anything to the servers. Um, so they want to have easier upgrades, right? They want that constant patching and constant upgrade and constant feature sets being rolled out like Microsoft does every day. Every day there's new stuff being deployed to share up online, to exchange online, to Teams. You know, that DevOps environment is, is really active. Uh, so they want to they get away from having to manage servers and stuff. And obviously, if you can push everything to share up online, you're not dealing with servers and OSs and things like that and vulnerabilities. You're, you at least push the vulnerability stuff to the to the cloud service provider. You would think that they have better capability to keep things more secure. But one of the biggest things is that that I've seen, at least in the unclass world, and obviously this is going to be for IL-6 and Secret and JWIX from an Office 365 perspective, is all the conditional access, all the data loss prevention, all the sensitivity labels, all the protection that you have and the visibility you have on where a document goes, who it gets sent to, who's opening it and reading it, who's printing it, all of that capability that's baked into Office is what really the government's going after, right? Um, you know, who's stealing documents nefariously, accidentally, whatever, who's emailing documents, uh, tagging's a big one, right? So, you know, there's a lot there's of- leaking, There's leaking yeah. court opinions. Yeah, exactly. Who's leaking court opinions? You know, all that kind of stuff is really powerful for the government. Um, so, you know, that's that's a big push to move everything into Office 365. Um, it's just those extra security capabilities. And this may be outside of the conversation, but assuming assuming my customer stays on. 19 on prem and this again this is going to get into the weeds what are our automation options going to be i mean if 2010 workflows are going away i'm, I'm assuming 13 workflows will go away at some point if we have 19 on prem are we going to have some some form of power automate and power apps not for 2019 nothing's been created to do that you're going to stick with designer workflows and Power Automate and Power Apps are only going to be cloud-based. You're not going to be able to connect those systems to 2019. The only integration from 2019 to any kind of version of cloud, and I don't even know if this will be available in Secret or JWIX, is going to be like the OneDrive integration. And um, there is a hybrid way to, you know, kind of keep things glued where whether you're on-prem or on in the cloud sites, you can't really tell. Um, but from a development standpoint, using Flow or now Power Automate or Power apps, none of that's going to be applicable to to 2019. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Have you go ahead, please, Karen. I apologize. Yeah. Um, in our environment, where with my customer right now, um, we've migrated our whole intranet over to the cloud, um, and then discovered that. And this is based on uh, of the, the two or three of us who have certifications. Um, I have a, a team certification that I got last year or whatever uh, earlier this year. And um, and the sort of panic that occurred, and we're a little bit in a holding pattern right now, is that the the basis of all of Office 365 is a Microsoft 365 group and the that when you do that you've got a you've got a permissions issue where it's throwing the door wide open to everybody um and the various layers you were just mentioning about sensitivity labels um and you know all those different tagging and and things that you can use to control your permissions We've kind of run into this issue. I don't know if you're you're probably aware of this since you're talking about these different clouds. That the DoD on their cloud has told us thou thou shalt open up your permissions. And so, literally, like right now, you know, I could go in and add my grandmother um, to you know the permissions and. This is just one of the issues that we've run into with this whole cloud migrating into the cloud is that 
Is this something you've run into or encountered this issue before where they, they really don't want to invite the whole world without any kind of controls, but we're being told on these clouds, environments, that we kind of uh, have to do that? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't know about your, your client right now, but I'll tell you, they should have external sharing for OneDrive and SharePoint completely turned off. And then there are about three lines of PowerShell to run in order to limit the number of people who can create a group in Microsoft 365 groups uh, to a, a small Active Directory security group. So whoever's in that Active Directory security group would only be the ones who are able to create Microsoft 365 groups and then you can have other automation stuff to create, you know, your groups and your teams and all that other good stuff with it. But you don't want willy nilly everybody being able to create groups because they will not be able to stick to any naming convention. They will screw things up royally. Right. And, and the thing about teams should be just completely turned off. Teams is is in essence a, a, a door where everybody can do that. People create channels and bam, yeah, all no. of a sudden, you know. That that that's that's fine. You can you can add people to your group. I get that, uh -huh. but the ability to create the group in the first place, uh -huh. there's some PowerShell that you can run that will limit those people down. Well, and so does that, that include if, all the ways that a group can be created? Because there's many yes. options. Yes. Yeah, there's there. Scott's right. There's you know, the, if you create so for, for example, if you create a team. Inside Teams, it automatically creates a SharePoint site collection, automatically creates an Outlook shared mailbox. Uh, it may even create a planner depending on what environment you're in. All that stuff is based off of an M365 group. So there are there are there is a way to limit uh, creation of Teams um, and it's PowerShell. And what you're basically doing is preventing someone from creating a group. Uh, essentially. Um, so now that that's counter to what Microsoft wants you to do, right? They want everybody to just be create teams and collaborate and, and whatnot. So you got to find a, a you know a, a nice happy medium um, between that. But I could tell you, just like I mean, even you know, get, giving users the ability to create a group or a, a, a team, and then that creates a site collection as a as a SharePoint admin. I'd be going nuts if I had one thousand site collections I'm managing and and all kinds exactly. of stuff. <laughs> Um, oh, so no, that, you, is, you, that is you a, keep that is a huge you pick yourself back out. Yeah, that's there, a huge. There's no reason for the, you to be in every one of those groups. That that's stupid. Here's the uh, you know, this is I'll put it in a Teams chat. Manage who can create groups. So basically, it's PowerShell. You're running it, and you can you can get kind of fancy too. You can you can even put some limitations on what type of group names can be created. Like you don't want president and CEO group to be created. Um. But essentially, you know, this is, you know, these are all the things that a, a group affects, right? Um, so when you're limiting that, you're limiting, you know, I guess you're limiting the user from actually collaborating. But, you know, it, it's probably good. This it, what what I usually recommend is you start off with limiting, and then you get training, and people understand, you know, they shouldn't just be creating willy nilly groups, um, or they have a special a, a quick turnaround help desk ticket that's I need a team created. It's not three or four or five days for a team to get created. You know, it's it's something that's more prioritized and gets created right away only by certain people because um, there is a sprawl effect that happens, right? You get a yeah. bunch of stuff. Um, you can use a SharePoint scroll. list. What? You can use a SharePoint list for people to put in the request to get a group created and then you can have Power Automate actually do the group creation for you so okay. it can run through the approval process and whatnot and then someone blesses it hits the button and actually creates a group and everything else that goes with it okay but i have this is really helpful and i've got so uh, the the sprawl is kind of too late where we're at they they implemented teams before they migrated over our intranet proper mm. and so by the time we got over there we have Hundred six more than six hundred um, <laughs> team sites and and Microsoft three sixty five groups associated and 
the issue now is we can't see them. Our SCA privileges don't let us see those things. Now, I know there's there's people up at the tippy top probably who can see those, but we, we don't even yeah. we haven't even gotten our governance written to try to adapt to all this. Um, there, there are a couple of ways around that, right? If you go to the SharePoint Admin Center and Microsoft 365, you can grant yourself site collection admin rights to any of those SharePoint sites that got created behind Teams. Okay. By just adding yourself to the owners group. However, you don't have any access to their team and their chat and all that stuff. So you would have to get the team admin center to add you to those teams, or you get the team owners to go ahead and add you whenever they need to add you. But for, you know, mission purposes, it's always good to not always have access to everything. You know, that's, right. that's a bad thing. It, it shouldn't be easy for anyone, anyone to be able to just grab data. Right. Yeah, what Scott's talking about is what I'm sharing on the screen now. If you, if you have SharePoint Admin, which is a, a, a role in Azure Active Directory, SharePoint Administrator, um, you, you can go to the SharePoint Admin page and see the active sites and see which ones are backed by Teams. If you're a Teams Admin, again, another role in Azure Active Directory, uh, you're able to see all the teams that are that have been created, um, you know, inside your tenant. Um, yeah. But you have to have those roles, you know. If you don't have those roles, then then you're not going to be able to see these things. Mm -hmm. here. So I here's a question that I have. Just to get our arms around this, surely we are not the first people to encounter this issue. Suddenly we've moved over into the cloud because Microsoft gave us the big warm and fuzzy. And now we're trying to figure out how the heck we're going to create a governance plan and then stand up all those controls that we need. Because now the, the number of layers and possibilities of controls are you know, yeah. legion. Yeah, governance so, should come before deployment. Yes, but, it should. You know, but in I'm, an ideal world. <laughs> well, look, at least your at least your customer is talking about governance. Our customer uh, thinks uh, it's a. I have a wonderful customer. At least I have wonderful uh, lower level management that I work with. Um, but uh, you know. There's always time to go ahead and fix this stuff. You have 600, that's not many. My organization that I'm supporting already has about 3,000 teams because we've got about 95,000 people in the organization. Um, so uh, I know what you're dealing with, It's but the cleanup isn't that difficult. It really isn't, um, you know, you're going to have to get the records management policies in there before you start deleting and moving things, but uh, it's not that hard. Uh, it might look daunting, but it, you know, how do you need an elephant one bite at a time? Yeah, but if you have a map for for which end you're starting, my my question is not is it difficult, but where where can people go to? um get a a guide to how to move forward with this um with this situation it may not be difficult but you do need to kind of have a clue of where to begin Joaquin, have you have you walked into a messy m365 environment and cleaned it up oh, i was on mute um i have and and um, so the first things first when when I walk into a messy environment is you, you have to run some reports to see because a lot sometimes a lot of these team sites and SharePoint sites that get created just don't ever get used, right? Right. So you, you start off there. That that would be my my first recommendation is let's run a report, PowerShell report, or even from Teams Admin Center on which sites have not been used over the last 30, 60, 90, 180, 365 days, right? And start there and then start implementing a, a procedure, a process to 
archiving those sites. And there are ways within Office 365 to archive sites that have not been used. Um, that I think will, will, that's a first thing. It's an easy low hanging fruit thing to do. You just gotta get the environment to agree what's gonna be the, the time limit, man, it's at six months. Um, and, uh, you know, start there, right? And that that tends to at least alleviate the, are we always gonna have 10,000 sites out there? No, eventually it's gonna trickle down. And then you and then you have to what, what I've recommended is you stop letting people just create sites and you go and you and you stop letting people create sites by using that script that I you know the link that I posted in the chat and you only limit certain groups of people the ability to do it and I know that's painful because the users have always been you know av available to you know used to just creating whatever they want to create but you you gotta you gotta lock it down you have to um so start there that that that, that would be next step number two and then start working on a governance plan going forward like you know what are sites going to be created for what templates what hub sites you're going to link your sharepoint sites to all those kind of things um but it's not easy right because you know users are used to doing what they're doing but you have to snip it and the only safe way to snip it, the supported way is to prevent users from creating groups and those that need them you know there's a process right so you have to you can't make the process hard for an end user to create a team site via request right if, you, if you're taking a week or two weeks to submit a ticket and get it answered people are just going to get angry right and not use the system you don't want that to be the case um so you got to have some flexibility there but the first thing is you know create an archiving policy that that will delete sites that are not in use. And then the second thing is limit the users who can create essentially M365 groups. Um, and that's gonna be the heavier hit, right? People are gonna immediately see that impact when they can't create a team. But if you also supplement that with a quick way of creating teams by submitting a ticket, and this is, we know that ticket's gonna be high priority and, and people get a team created, then it makes it a little easier. Uh, that's the only way to do it. There's really no magic bullet no silver bullet that'll fix it all. That's that's really helpful. And if we do that in our environment, we'll be miles ahead. Um, and then my my other question, and I don't expect there to be as easy an answer for this, is is there guidance anywhere uh, as far as like how to combine the various controls um, to achieve um, whatever your um, you know permission schema is because ours is rather complex um, you know is there a place you can go that says well you know you would use sensitivity labels to control this level of stuff and you know your SharePoint permissions you don't want to do everything with that you want to have that be the last layer and that's going to be inside here and you're going to do that at this site collection level but outside of that you want to make sure if you're federated that you've got these controls happening out there and you want to make sure you've got access reviews you know is there some some place out there that can help, i you know? yeah i've never seen a consolidated um guidance on what to you know how do you how do you implement that um it's it's all scattered everywhere and and the only thing i could the only advice i can give is usually it shouldn't be from my from my perspective it shouldn't be dictating um sensitivity labels and things like that. it should be your legal slash isso folks that are compliance officers if you have them maybe you don't they should dictate the, the policies, the labeling, right, and the DLP portions, and then you implement those as, as an IT administrator or engineer. Uh, and that may make it easier, because if you're trying to trying to come up with sensitivity labels yourself, you, you may not, you know, you, you're not a lawyer, maybe you are, but I'm not a lawyer, so I never go into an environment saying, okay, these are the four labels I'm gonna <laughs> implement and do that, because I'm not the one that's, you know, I don't know what regulations the, the company have to meet, whether HIPAA or, you know, whatever, so. Um, as far as implementing those labels and controls and whether or not this site's going to have this DLP policy that's applied to this container SharePoint or Teams is going to limit external access. 
that's all that should be all be driven by legal right that should all be driven by the compliance officers and stuff like that um it those are all, all those things are easily easily done technically they're easy to implement um but you can implement them incorrectly if you're not following you know whatever the, the legal requirement is um but there's no single document that says hey if uh there are documents that i'm looking for some right now that show you how to create a sensitivity label and map it to a DLP policy and map it to a SharePoint container. Um, but the the meat behind all that is what's the label? What's the label going to do? You have to know what the business wants the label to do. Does the label say this is public? And what does public mean? That means anyone can see it. Okay, then that's your DLP policy. There's no, there's no encryption, no nothing. It's just anyone can see it. Is it confidential? And what does confidential mean? Only certain people can see it or everyone in the organization or certain domains. You know, th those are the rules you have to apply in the DLP policy in order to to, to meet the, the that requirement. So it's kind of it's kind of hard to to have a, a document that kind of captures all that. Unfortunately, I've never seen one really because every every company is different, right? Yeah, I don't know hey, if that's Karen, helping. Is anything is, or, is this for a government client or is this for the company that you're with? This is a government client, and I, um, you know how people don't really know what they want. They don't, <clears throat> they don't, it's, it's yeah. hard for them to articulate their requirements when they don't know what marbles yeah. they have in front of them. Yeah. Um, if, if I, there were a way to go to them and say, you can specify this kind of stuff, and you can specify those kinds of things and these kind of things over here. And we know how to set up the controls to do that, but you have to answer these questions and these questions and these questions. Then they could turn around and do that. Mm -hmm. But this is a whole new paradigm. There's never before been a time when all in kind of one huge cloud package, all these things were actually available. And we just have to ask good questions that they can answer. I want to know what are those good questions? Like a minute ago, you were just saying sensitivity labels are going to depend on legal. Well, I didn't realize that. We were thinking sensitivity labels would be classification. You know, there, no. there are appropriate contexts for these controls. And I'm trying to find a way to bridge that gap to help the government know what information to provide. And then we can put it in place. Yeah. It's really challenging when when your customer's head is still stuck in IT ten years ago, right? Yeah. Which is um, exactly where we are as well. Well, here here's here's a couple of suggestions. Karen, one, talk to Joaquin so that he can do a uh, cold uh, proposal to that organization. Um, but uh, um, two the i i helped craft the classification guidance for an agency before i ever met joaquin uh this was talking years ago and so i understand exactly the kinds of stuff that qualifies to be ts versus secret etc i mean like from that point of view and so typically in whatever organization that you're with you have a classification guide or you have an office that is actually creating those classification guidance uh, pieces for you. Mm -hmm. And those individuals need to be the ones creating your sensitivity levels. Sure. So okay. here, yeah. I don't know if you see what I put on the on, on the on the share on the screen. I don't know if you're able to see that. Huh? So like here, are you able to see what I'm in my notepad? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's kind of small. Let me make it bigger. Yeah, making it bigger could be good. Also, my glasses are filthy. That's not helpful. <laughs> oh, that's much better. Thank you. So, you know, these may be, you know, these are very generic, but mm -hmm. these may be four labels that you may want to start with, right? Public, mm -hmm. confidential, internal and partner plus encryption. Mm -hmm. Highly confidential internal only plus encryption and then restricted mm -hmm. internal only plus encryption plus certain users, right? So like these are labels that you can create and then you can assign okay. a DLP policy to them. 
and the DLP policy would would essentially the DLP would apply whatever these rules mean internal only. Obviously, that's your own domain internally. You're going to encrypt it, and uh, if it's if you know if this <coughs> is picked, then only certain users are, are going to be able to see it. Right? This is very super super duper restricted. So, for example, this could be here. I'll even make it more uh, contracts. Right? Restricted contracts. So only contract people part of the contracts group can see and open and you know use you know this, and you can you can start with like a basic set of labels, and and then apply a basic set of DLP policies to that, and then again you can apply those DLP policies to DLP policies to Exchange Online, um, to SPO, to Teams. Uh, OneDrive, so you can apply, uh, and and if you you know if you have the Azure on-prem scanner, which will scan your on-prem file shares and then apply these labels if you have it turned on, um, you know you can apply these labels to 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 data that's you know if you so these are labels, and if you also assign a sensitivity info type sensitivity sensitivity uh, <laughs> info type which could be like scan for special words or whatever um, you can then find all documents that have code word blue in it or whatever and it'll automatically tag those documents but anyways i would you know for an organization that doesn't have any real guidance or any real rules or they're just kind of like i don't know maybe you start off with four Right, public, mm -hmm. confidential, highly confidential, and restricted, and that may stir. I, what I've what I've noticed is when you when you provide something, when you provide something to someone, it's it it starts them thinking like, oh no 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 no, I don't want restricted. I exactly. want restricted this, and you're like, oh okay, well what is that? And then they start thinking how you want them to think, um, versus them just coming up with this stuff, right? You come up with it and let them correct you. And then by by then correcting you, you're essentially getting what you want out of them, right? <laughs> Which is exactly. so that's I don't exactly know if that's helpful right. or not. It's very helpful. It's very, very helpful. You just talked about combining controls. Um and and that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I, I wish there was some sort of a guide out there to help you think through those things and you know, but but this is a great helpful example really helpful and thank you so much i appreciate it yeah absolutely sure um yeah unfortunately yeah. like i wish there was something that was like all encompassing that kind of had a plan for let me see there could be something other if i find it i'll send it to scott and I'll send it to you um uh i mean you, you know you may want to look at this i'm put i'm post this this link inside the chat it's essentially, you know, they've changed the name. It's not Microsoft yeah. Information Protection anymore. It's Microsoft Purview, Purview. whatever. Um, but here's yeah. so all of this stuff, all of DLP, sensitivity labels, tagging, classification, um, uh, 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 you know, um, data loss prevention, and right. Right. all that stuff is called Microsoft Information Protection. Man, uh, okay. So information protection, right? It's not Purview. Okay. And they have, you know, so this link here has all these things that you can, you know, kind of plan and study. But if you read them, if you read this stuff, it's really going to tell you, tell you, you need to have a data plan, right? If you don't have a data plan, you're kind of, right. you know, you're, you're, there's nothing. All this is means nothing unless you have a plan. And that, and part of that data plan is understanding what you want, what the gut, what the customer wants to tag. What are they, what are they trying to protect? You know, so for example, a good example is. If I do any work for the defense industry base that's doing CMMC, I know they're going to have CUI and they're going to have FCI. So those are labels that I will create for them because CUI means something to them. FCI, financial control, means something to them. Um, oh. You know, so the government, ha they have something that means something to them. You may have to extract it. And, and I think the best way to try to extract it is like force these standard labels on them and see what they say. Um, oh. I think you're going to get a lot of thinking out of their heads uh, once you once you show them some label structure, you know they're either going to yeah. like it and say yeah this is great implement it or they're going to be like no that's <clears throat> silly I don't like that I want this and then you get what you want. 
That's excellent. Really, thank you. Yep. Very helpful. Good little Mike. Um, See you all later. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I got a challenge for you, Karen. You learn all this stuff, and then you come back and speak to a group in like two or three months on how to implement it. Sounds great. They want me to write the governance because I'm the one asking the questions, you know, and I'm just the SharePoint piano player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm responsible for governance uh, where I am, and I can probably give you a little bit of help on that, um, at least a starting point. But um, we can talk about that another time. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop recording, and then if anyone wants to keep on talking, they are more than welcome to, but I'm stopping right now.